You know, you know, when you get to be my age, you go from one room to another and you can't remember why. And you stand there and you're thinking, is this senility or sensomia? And, and it, depends, it depends on what you were doing that day. I, uh, but I'm here, I'm here seriously to represent the Committee for Surrealist Investigation of Claims of the Normal. Which, uh, <laughs> which developed out of the College of Pataphysique in Paris uh, in the old days and was based on uh, the work of Professor Timothy F.X. Finnegan who uh, was a graduate of the College of Pataphysique who returned to Dublin to teach at uh, Trinity College there and Professor Finnegan uh, demonstrated very clearly that nobody has ever encountered a normal human being. <laughs> uh, you, you can look far and wide, you can go out like Diogenes with a lantern, uh, and you'll never find a normal human being. I mean, Jesse Helms, who has been mentioned a few times, I think he's defending normalcy, but he, he, he's totally abnormal. Uh, uh, as everybody else is. The, the, the normal is that which does not quite exist. It's, it's a mathematical fiction invented by the English to try to get everybody to behave like them. Wait a minute, I've been getting advice from so many quarters, I, I don't know what I, uh, I feel like Michelle Pfeiffer in the fabulous Baker Boys when she gets up and starts to sing and the mic isn't on and the first thing that comes over the mic is fucking thing doesn't work and uh, turn it down. Well, put it down no, turn. hello how are we doing now Real good. turn it on turn it on it's on how are you doing? Can you hear me at all? Okay, okay. Um, well, Michelle Pfeiffer, a fucking thing is, where was I? Oh yeah, uh, fin Finnegan, uh, the Finnegan's work. Um, and, and nobody has ever experienced an average day. You, you try to go back through your life and pick out an average day, you've never had one. There's never been a normal human being living an average day. Uh, these things are total fictions. And, and, then, and then, the, uh, then the British invented time, which is a sinister device to make people work more than is good for a human being, or natural. <laughs> now, uh, as uh, De Selby says in his comments on, uh, his commentary on Finnegan, Finnegan was probably the most Irish philosopher who ever lived uh, because the Irish as a, as a whole culture are in rebellion against time. Uh, and in Cork, there are, there are four clocks on the, side of the tower of the town hall facing the four quarters and invoking the four great spirits that all shamanic traditions are based on, which are very deep in Ireland with the four provinces and all. And each of these clocks has a different time on it whenever you uh, check them by walking around. Uh, people in Cork uh, call them the four liars. Uh, go going through Dublin, you can very easily get 17 different times uh, within about five minutes. And these 17 times are separated not just by minutes, but sometimes by hours. Especially when they have daylight savings time, which half of the citizens refuse to observe, so the clocks are, there are clocks that are always an hour apart in different parts of Dublin. Uh, the, uh, the Celtic uh, genius for invention, uh, for entering the most poetic realms of imagination, uh, which, is, uh, which my wife uh, calls the, the Irish uh, genius for denial, uh, my, 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 my wife and I lived in Ireland for six years and we came to opposite conclusion. She decided it was one huge dysfunctional family. And uh, I decided it was the only place on earth where the puka could still survive. 
uh, and this is to, to a great deal due to the work of Professor Finnegan, uh, who, as I say, is quintessentially Irish. You look at who, who are the really great Irish uh, thinkers. Well, Jonathan Swift, who proved that just because a man asserts that he's still alive, you don't have to accept, accept that. You can still argue the matter. Uh, this came up in Swift's debate with Partridge. Uh, Partridge was the leading astrologer in Dublin, and Swift put out an astrological almanac under the name Isaac Beckersniff, and uh, entity predicted Partridge's death, along with a lot of other interesting events, like uh, a member of a royal family of Europe will fall off a horse, which was absolutely guaranteed to happen at least once during the year. Yeah, you know, and there will be plagues and, you know, the usual things and a lot of weird things, like frogs will fall out of the sky on this date. And uh, Partridge was highly indignant at having competition from this upstart Becker sniff. <laughs> and even more, finding his own death predicted. So he put out a pamphlet expo exposing Becker Sniff's total ignorance of the science of astrology, his pretentiousness, <laughs> the fact that he was a charlatan, and, Be and Partridge concluded that uh, the day of his death, he would, the day after his alleged death, he would bring forth another pamphlet showing the extent of Becker Sniff's errors. Well, the day after his alleged death, uh, Partridge published his pamphlet. I'm still here, Beck Becker Sniff is refuted. And Swift, like a good Dubliner, sat down and wrote a point-by-point -point refutation, showing that just because Partridge insists he's alive, we don't have to believe him. If we're going to follow pure logic, we, we can define terms in such a way we prove he's dead. From every proof that he's alive, we can turn it into a proof he's dead. Uh, and this has always been the Irish attitude towards logic. Logic is, a, is another device the British invented to make us all act like Englishmen, <laughs> which uh, nobody would want to do but a mad dog. You know, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. I know everybody else with any sense goes to the pub and has a few pints. <laughs> and, uh, uh, the, uh, the other, my, uh, Swift's very close friend at Trinity College, George Barclay later became a bishop. And he is most famous for proving that Newton was wrong about the calculus. He got the whole damn the derivation of the infinitesimal wrong, which is uh, another, just, just typical of the Irish desire to blow up anything English. <laughs> Newton was being put forth as the greatest scientist of the time, so Barclay found a mathematical error in Newton. And they've been arguing about it for the last 300 years, but majority opinion is that Barclay won. And then he set forth to prove the universe doesn't exist, uh, which undermines English imperialism at the root. Uh, uh, Barclay, Barclay's proof is based on the idea that the universe doesn't exist, but God thinks that it does. He, 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 does, uh, he does not propose any solution to this dementia on the part of God. We're sort of stuck with it until God recovers. And then like good Buddhists, presumably, we can vanish into the void again. Uh, another, another great Irish thinker uh, was William Rowan Hamilton, uh, generally considered the greatest mathematician Ireland ever produced. Now, from ancient times until Hamilton, it was believed that x times y equals y times x. I'm sure some of you encountered that at some point in your educational careers. What was that again? Uh, they, uh, back, back in the days when school children were expected to know something, all, all school, uh, in those reactionary times, all school children know that. <laughs> x times y equals y times x. Self-evident on the face of it, just like Partridge is arguing he's alive, he must be alive. That does not account for Irish logic. Uh, Rowan Hamilton said, but God, I'll prove it's not true. And he invented a system of mathematics in which x times y does not equal y times x at all at all. <laughs> and a hundred years later, this turned out to be the natural system of mathematics for quantum physics. So don't underestimate the cleverness of the Irish and their resolute attempt uh, to absolutely destroy English imperialism and wipe it off the face of the earth. 
You see, there are two types of Irish, chiefly. The IRA who blow up English things literally, and the Irish philosophers and artists who blow up the English worldview. Uh, Finnegan devoted most of his attention to the word is. Uh, he said, every time we use this accursed Sassanach verb, uh, Sassanach is, Gael is uh, Irish Gaelic for uh, English or uh, Saxon. Uh, every time we use this accursed Sassanach verb, we are perpetuating the empire. The empire never ended. Uh, many of the Irish thought the British Empire had fallen apart and only held on to a little bit of Northern Ireland, but according to Timothy F.X. Finnegan, the empire exists within the structure of the English language. So anybody communicating in English is subliminally being programmed to accept the Queen of England <laughs> as legitimately one of the five richest women in the world. Now, nobody knows who the other four richest women in the world are, but we all assume they did something for their money. Uh, some, something or other. They got it uh, one way or, you know, they, they made some contribution. Uh, if, uh, at the lowest level, they married the right guy. That inquires a bit of sexual intelligence and evolutionary know-how. Uh, uh, the Queen of England is renowned for being rich for no reason at all, except that she's the queen. She is the queen. You see, the verb lies in that little word. That the, the problem lies in that little word, is. Uh, every time you say is, you are perpetuating monarchy, the English dominion over the planet, and if everybody started talking Gaelic, we'd be liberated completely. And uh, for this, uh, Tim uh, Timothy Finnegan is known as the great Irish philosopher of the 20th century, a scholar who, as the Selby said at his funeral, who was always wise, always gentlemanly, and occasionally sober. <laughs> which is the, the highest praise you can speak of any... Uh, <laughs> uh, Irish facts uh, are, are very, very malleable, too. I, what I'm doing, you see, is I'm trying to get you into an Irish reality tunnel because San Francisco is pretty goddamn dreary. Uh, if, you can get, if you can escape to Ireland even for a few minutes listening to me doing my magic tricks, um, one of the best known Irish facts, everybody who's ever may had a course uh, on modern Irish literature or modern British literature, they slipped it into both, knows the story of how on Yeats's 40th birthday, James Joyce went to Yeats's hotel and uh, went to his room, knocked on the door and said, I hear you're 40 today. And Yeats said, yes. And Joyce said, too bad, you're too old to be influenced by me. Now that, uh, uh, you, if you want to make a, so you want to make a little, uh, a real study of this, uh, go down to the San Francisco Library and pull out the books on Joyce and Yates and start looking through them and see how many books that story is in. Now that's a typical Irish fact. An Irish fact is something that fucks up the heads of people who are trying to find out what the real facts are. <laughs> It's sort of like a rubber inch. It introduces relativity into our concept of ontology, which has always been uh, the Celtic view. There, always, there should be some relativity in there. Uh, this, uh, this Irish fact can be recognized as distinct from a British or American fact. Uh, like Anthony Burgess uh, has written that English and, uh, English and American English are both functional and rational languages whereas Irish English is still a ludic language. Americans and English uh, speak to, uh, to each other mostly to talk about how to get the job done or uh, how, to, how to buy the latest gimmick. Uh, Irish English is spoken just for the sheer delight of the sound of it or the poetry or the paradox of it. Like two Dubliners meet and one says, ah, Patty, terrible weather for this time of year. And Patty says, I sure it's not this time of year at all. <laughs> uh, or, uh, I, I said to a cab driver in Dublin, I was praising a lot of the architecture. I said, but that building is pretty ugly. He said, ugly is no word for it. It's desperate entirely. <laughs> It's literally true. The Irish have larger vocabularies than any other group in the English-speaking world. They, they, they pull words out like, you know, like jewels from bags. 
when you have nothing else but poverty, you learn to treasure your words, I guess. Um, anyway, the, the, the Joyce Yates, uh, you're too old to be influenced by me, uh, exposed itself to us as an Irish fact. When we compare it with public facts, such as on Yates's 40th birthday, he wasn't at that hotel in Dublin, he was in London. Or on that day, uh, James Joyce wasn't in Dublin either. He was teaching in the Berlitz Language School in Trieste in Italy. Or, or the fact that uh, the origin of this story was Oliver Sanjin Gogarty, the greatest inventor of Irish facts in the 20th century. <laughs> Uh, Amer American scholars go over to Ireland with this naive idea they, they can do uh, on the ground uh, research and come back with great new insights into Yates, Joyce, O'Casey, all of the wild, sure, all of the great Irish writers of the last hundred years and uh, Dubliners will tell them anything they think they'll believe. I mean, because the function of an Irish fact is to fuck up the heads of people who think they can find out what a fact is. Uh, uh, Nietzsche said there are no facts, only interpretations. Uh, the Dublin attitude is there are no facts, only what you can get away with. And you can get away with a great deal if you take this as a resolute motto. As, uh, for instance, uh, take uh, Orson Welles' movie, F for Fake which I tend to consider the greatest movie ever made. Uh, uh, <clears throat> F for Fake is about uh, Clifford Irving, who wrote a biography of Elmer, who had served a short term in France for art forgery. He told his whole, in the inside story of all of his he, uh, exploits to Irving, who then wrote it up, revealing Elmer as the greatest art forger of all times, it turns out half of the uh, my impressionist paintings in museums are by Elmer. Every van, most of the Van Goghs you have stood in awe before. Many of the Cezannes, a hell of a lot of the Modigliani's, uh, they, these are all Elmer's. And uh, uh, the reason most of them have not been removed from museums is that the experts who authenticated them don't want to admit that Elmer swindled them and insist that these things are real in spite of the fact that he's confessed to having done them. Uh, Elmia says very early in the film they cannot be art forgers without art experts. If there was nobody to say this is a valuable painting and this one isn't, people would have to think for themselves and then there'd be no room for forgers at all. But as soon as art experts appear and say I can identify this as a Cezanne and prove that a Cezanne is better than uh, Pissarro, uh, then uh, the art forgers immediately appear and start producing more Cezannes. Uh, to digress a bit, uh, <laughs> without getting into Salvador Dali's map of Europe, which consists only of Spain and Dublin, a very interesting insight, the uh, <laughs> Uh, just before Salvador Dali's death, the French police seized a whole bunch of can blank canvases with Dali's signature or a forgery on them. Uh, due to a uh, prolonged investigation, they became convinced that it was Dali's signature. Uh, Dali was selling blank canvases with his signature to forgers to make so the forgers didn't have to forge the signature, so the signature would be real and the forgeries would sell faster for more money. And you see, Dolly, who once said, the only difference between me and a madman is that I am not mad. Uh, Dolly, had, Dolly had figured out that if you're successful, the forgers are going to start cut, make, taking a cut of the profits. So he figured out how to take a cut of the profits of the forgers by selling them his signature on canvas. And then they just did the best Dolly they could do. And uh, I, think, I, I think this definitely shows the advantages of insanity, which, uh, which is asked to be genetic. There's more and more evidence. Read Brain, Mind, Bulletin, any issue. The Dollies came to Spain in the 17th century. It was called the Flight of the Earls. When Red U O'Neill uh, pulled out of Ireland, a whole bunch of other families went with him, including the Dalys. And after 300 years in Spain, the name Daly had become Dolly. 
which is why Salvador Dali's paintings only make sense if you're thinking in Gaelic when you look at them. <laughs> and uh, getting, getting back to F for fake, Orson Welles at the beginning of the movie uh, tells you that even though this is about two notorious f frauds, we're going to tell the truth in this movie and we'll even repeat <laughs> that in writing. And uh, on, on writing, it comes on the screen and Wells reads it aloud. For the next one hour, we will tell you nothing but the truth. At the end of the movie, which runs an hour and 17 minutes, you find out that Wells admits he's been lying for the last 17 minutes that everything you've seen is fiction. Uh, it's a magic trick. And you come out and think, well, that was clever. But then when you go back and see the movie again, you realize Wells was lying about things all through the movie. And so were Irving and so were Elmer. And then you start to wonder, was Elmir lying about his, the degree of his success as an art forger? <laughs> Maybe the experts are telling the truth. Maybe he only forged a few paintings, a couple of hundred maybe, if, maybe only a few dozen. Uh, or maybe half of the paintings we admire are Elmir's. And you start looking into the movie more closely, like every artist wants to, what artists want most is for people to pay attention and look really closely. So you look more closely to try to figure out when Elmir is lying, and you realize you're dealing with a professional liar. <laughs> and then you get to Clifford Irving, who was supposed to have checked every fact in the Elmir story and found out it was true. Clifford Irving, uh, while they were making the film to add to the drama, or rather before they started the film, but inserted into the film by Wells by one of his little fakes, as if they just discovered it while they were making the film, Clifford Irving was uh, uh, denounced as a hoaxer <laughs> because he had a, a contract to write the autobiography of Howard Hughes with Howard Hughes' signature on it. Uh, Irving denied that he was a liar, a hoaxer, or a swindler. There was a lot of debate about it. Experts were called in and they authenticated the signature. Then somebody <laughs> From how, uh, calling from Howard Hughes headquarters in uh, Las Vegas claiming to be Howard Hughes, repudiated the whole thing, said it was a forgery, and he never met with Clifford Irving. And uh, Irving was uh, sued for several million dollars and uh, threatened with uh, all sorts of uh, legal action, most of which never came to pass for reasons that passed the comprehension of anybody blinded by the English language and the British monarchy. But, uh, uh, there's a point in the movie where uh, Elmir uh, says, you know, it is no crime to paint in another artist's style. It has never been defined as a crime anywhere in any country known to me. It becomes a crime when the signature is put on. And I never put the signatures on. I like to paint in other people's styles and I wanted to sell them. I suspected some of the people I was selling to would put signatures on, but I didn't know it exactly. And uh, Wells says, do you expect us to believe that? And then you get several shots of Elmia looking in various directions, and all through it there's a clock ticking. And about the 19th time you see the film, you realize Wells made up a montage of shots of Elmia at various times and put them together and put the clock in on the soundtrack to make you think this was all continuous. And it's not Elmir reacting to that question at all. It could be Elmir reacting to dozens of other things. So your attempts to read the truth into Elmir's reactions, looking up, looking down, scratching his head, rubbing his chin, all of this is entirely a delusion. And at this point, the question is, these are the techniques that Wells pioneered in Citizen Kane, this kind of creative editing. And if it was art in Citizen Kane, is it still art here, or is it just a fake here? And then you realize F for Fake is a documentary about the impossibility of making a documentary. So therefore, it's the only honest documentary ever made. Because every other documentary implicitly says, I, the filmmaker, am God. I can find out the truth and reveal the truth to you. But nobody can do that. You've got to figure it out for yourself, and you're usually guessing wrong. <laughs> that scene with uh, the, the tick, 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 and Elmir looking in all sorts of directions, Wells' voice comes in, and he may have not been in that room at all. He may have just been in the studio in Paris where he was editing this film. This is in a room in Ibiza off the coast of Spain. God knows where Wells is. I've noticed very carefully that he's not in the shot, just his voice is, so you think he was there. 
uh, Wells asks, uh, who did the Howard Hughes signature? And then you get shots of Elmere and Clifford Irving looking in various <laughs> directions. And you can read as much guilt into that as you want, or you can read Wells' trickery. After all, he started out as a stage magician, and uh, when he wasn't doing too well at that, he walked into the Gay Theater in Dublin, uh, and uh, like all things became immediately a subject of Irish facts. According to the standard legend, Wells persuaded Michael McLear Moore and Hilton Edwards, who were running the gate, they were both actors, producers, directors, uh, worked in tandem combination. They were gay lovers, an interesting historical details, since sodomy is still a crime punishable by 20 years imprisonment at hard labor in Ireland. Everybody knew they were gay, nobody turned them in. Uh, the Irish don't believe in enforcing their own laws, evidently. Uh, Wells walked in at the age of 16 and convinced them he was a, a big star on the American stage who wanted to learn Irish acting techniques and got a leading role in their next performance. Now that's the standard version. Michael McLeamore in a BBC interview uh, said that uh, that wasn't true at all. He and Hilton Edwards looked at Wells and said, this is a remarkable young man who has the guts to think he can fool us. Maybe he can fool an audience. Let's give him a chance. <laughs> According to Orson, in another later BBC interview, Michael McLeamore made that up. He wasn't even there when Hilton Edwards hired him. He was in London appearing in another play. So once again, Irish facts and ordinary facts do not seem to be able to coincide. The one thing is clear is that Wells got to star at the Gate Theatre at the age of 16 with no previous professional experience and convinced everybody he was a professional actor. And as he says in F for Fake, and I've been an acting faker ever since. So which makes you wonder how many of his performances were real Orson Welles, and how many of them were fake Orson Welles. Uh, Picasso uh, once was asked by an art dealer, I bought, I've been offered these paintings that are all supposed to be by you, and I think some of them are forgeries. Would you look them over and separate out the forgeries? So Picasso started stacking them up. This is real, this is real, this is real, this is a forgery, this is real, this is real, this is a forgery, this is real, this is a forgery. And the dealer said, Pablo, wait, that last one, I was here the weekend you painted that. That's not a forgery. Picasso said, yes it is. I can fake a Picasso as well as any thief in Europe. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that, that's a very insidious story. I mean, like Finnegan's... Like Finnegan's attack on the use of identity, if you can't say what anything is, if everything turns out to exist in a realm beyond the reach of our verbalizations, vocalizations, structures, grammatical conventions, and so on, if you can't say what anything is, you're thrown into a kind of Zen state. And when you think about Picasso long enough, uh, saying that he can fake a Picasso as well as anybody else, you end up in the predicament I'm in that when I write something now, I ask, is this a real Robin Anton Wilson? Or did I just fake a Robin Anton Wilson because I didn't have enough mental energy today to do the real thing? And I'm never quite sure. And the thing is, the critics aren't quite sure either, but they have more confidence in the years of identity, so they'll tell you whether it's a real Robin Anton Wilson or I just did a fake that day. But that is of identity is what upholds the British monarchy. And I want to say in conclusion that all of the claims by Professor Laputa of Madrid that uh, Professor, uh, Professor Jesus Magdalena Laputa is the leading critic of Finnegan among European philosophers, and according to Professor Laputa, uh, his infamous book tries to f prove links between Professor Finnegan and the IRA. This is dirty British propaganda, even if it does come from a Spanish source. <laughs> and uh, now, now that I've made clear my total objectivity about political affairs, uh, what I want to know is when Saddam Hussein was supposed to violate, uh, was supposed to have violated UN sanction, UN resolutions, George Bush said, we got to bomb the damn place right away. They never bombed Saddam Hussein. They bombed a lot of innocent bystanders. But the, the, the idea was, as far as I can grasp it, they, to establish that nobody can violate UN sanctions. 
Now Israel took 450 people without trial and put them out in the middle of the desert to freeze, violating UN sanctions. Why the hell isn't the United States bombing, the, bombing Israel right now? I'll leave you with that Zen koan to work on.